Hi, I'm Evelyn, the face behind the modern needle where um, I design and knit and sew everything for knitters or quilters or cross stitchers to make your life generally easy. And I love designing things that are quite easy. Um, so as I was working on a design for a Tetris memory blanket and I searched the YouTube for hours and hours and hours to see is there already something out there that I'm thinking about because there is no sense repeating really good videos a second time or whatnot but there wasn't really anything out there and what I actually realized is what is also not out there is a color study about these scrap blankets or memory blankets or uh, patchwork blankets or whatever you want to call them there is a lot out there for quilters but really not a lot for knitters so i thought i'll address that so first of all patchwork blankets or scrappy blankets or whatever they are are kind of just whatever that sounds like they are either rows upon rows of knitting or crocheting or collar or their little boxes or their little triangles or in this case they are mitered squares because that's going to be my new um that is going to be my new design but i was thinking about um when i was researching this or looking into this um how do you put all of the colors together and does it matter does it need to be all scraps does it need to be all new what does it need to be? Can you mix and match fibers? Can you put acrylic and wool and whatever together? Or do you need to keep to one? Or does it all need to be the same gauge? Like, can I mix a sock yarn with a bulky yarn and whatever yarn? How does that work? Like, where do I start? How do I go about it? So I have a few simple ideas of background to give you. And then from there, I hope I give you the tools and the knowledge to confidently pick your colors and pick your fabric to put together a beautiful blanket that you're gonna love. And let's face it, these things are gonna be around forever. Like who doesn't have grandma's granny square crochet blanket that's been in the dog great forever because it just hung around for such a long time and it's full of pills and whatever it doesn't look as nice anymore and maybe you have it revered and have it laying somewhere or whatnot but generally these things hang around for a long time so I thought it's only prudent that we do give them a little bit of thought so the first thought that is what structure do they have to be? Do they all need to be, um, do I make all little boxes and do I sew them together or do I knit row by row or do I knit like the, the 10 stitch blanket where you start in the square and you just knit around and around and around and around until you're done, like how? Where do I start? So my first thought about that is think about how you want to use this blanket. As I'm designing this um, Tetris memory blanket, what I want to do, I mean, first of all, it'll be my sample and I don't want it to be huge or knit on it for a couple of years because I want the pattern to be in the box and ready for sale so that everybody can enjoy it. Um, but how do you figure that out? So for myself, I like knitting in my um, lazy boy chair so I want the blanket to be big enough and wide enough to come from here to here and to go I'm one 157 or five foot three so I want the blanket to be about that long since nobody has a blanket that comes right up to the head if I make it as tall as I am and I have it up here I have plenty for my feet if I want to double it up or I'll double it up here where I often colder or snuggle in. So for the couch blanket that I want, that's exactly how I want it. And I think it'll probably be maybe a meter 
or um, 40 inches by 5 foot 3 or 157 something like that not an exact science so go by what you want if you're gonna make um, a blanket for for a baby to play on the floor or to take in the car or a wheelchair blanket or somebody for a nursing home or whatever you want if you want it for a bed then just figure it out and go from there now how do you know how many stitches you would use for that that's the other thing um so if you go row by row you have to do a little bit of math first i would recommend that you make a swatch about this big it only needs to be about this high and you can what i would recommend do it in the stitch that you that that you want to use if you're going to make it in garter and throw the odd uh, eyelet lace in there or if you're going to crochet it and you're going to use single crochet and double crochet alternatively or whatever it is that you want to use use that um have a ruler make this watch maybe i don't know eight inches by one or two inches and that'll give you an idea of is the fabric going to be squishy the way that i like it does it is it open are there holes in it like do i like this with the needle that i picked because you're going to go through your stash or to the store but i'm going to talk about stash here first so if you go to your stash you pick what you have the most of in my case i would probably have to say sock weight yarn which is a number one it has so and so many wraps per inch and the yarn council comes up with anything that's from this many wraps to this many wraps is a number one from this many wraps to this many wraps is a number two from this many to that many is number three etc and then they're either fingering lace fingering sport worsted dk no dk worsted i get those two mixed up sometimes and um erin and bulky and super bulky and so on so pick what you have the most of for me this would be fingering however i suffer from um rheumatoid arthritis so for me to make a blanket out of fingering weight yarn It's almost like making a yarn, uh, making a blanket out of a napkin. That's not thick enough for me. So in the summertime, yes, that would be nice in the evenings. And I might do something like that. But um, for blanket for me, I want to have a, a number four weight. Um, which is this kind. You knit it anywhere with... Um, with the knitting num with the knitting needle number four to five and a half. Um, and again, those are recommendations. You use the needle that you like. I like using a five or a five and a half, but I've used four and four and a half. So it doesn't really matter. So give that a whirl and see what your gauge is. So let's say you did a swatch. I'm gonna use 10 inches just for ease of talking about this. So if we have a swatch that's 10 inches, let's pretend this here is 10 inches, this bit here, and I had to cast on 60 stitches to get this, I know that if I want to have a blanket that's like 40 inches or 50 inches wide, I have to multiply that by that many um, stitches. So that's a good way to do it. If you're going to do a mitered blanket, mitered blankets are really cool. I think that they're the queen's bee of whatever that is. That and the octagonal blankets, like I'm just, or the hexagons, they're just my thing. So what you can do is, um, the way that they work is, you start off with a rectangle and then you miter it and it'll draw up. 
dried up. So it has two bits to the cast on. The first bit of the cast on is this side. Then you need to place a marker and then it'll be this side, even though you're knitting in the flat, but because you're decreasing at a steady rate in the middle, it'll pull that into a miter and it'll pull that rectangle into a square. So half of the stitches that you cast on will determine the box. So let's say, just for example, these are 40 stitch miters, these ones. So here I made 10 stitch miters or 20 stitch miters, like 10 on this side, 10 on this side, 20 on this side and 20 on this side. Um, and the 20 is really what determines how wide that box is going to be or the 10. So if you have 10 or 12 or a number that's easily divisible, so this big one here or four little ones, or I can make one big one that's like this, which would be, um, if this is a 40 stitch one, like 20 here and 20 here, I would have to make an 80 stitch one, 40 here and 40 here to get another super big one, which is what I did over here. So you can see how it is quite easy to figure out how these miters kind of go together. I'll stand up a little bit. And <clears throat> here I can just fill them in the way that I go along because I do not like sewing together and that's the next thing. So <clears throat> for right now, we're still on how big do I want that to be? So now you have made your measurements, you know that I'm making it up. 80 stitches go into this square and that 80 stitches makes 10 inches. I want it to be 40 inches long. So I'll have to multiply that by the number that fits into the 40 um, inches. Now with the mitered squares, again, like I said, it'll only be the one line that determines your width because the other part beyond the stitch marker makes up the height. So it's actually like this. You start off like this and then my hands don't go flat enough. You start off flat and the miter pulls it together until you have a box. So um, only half of these stitches here will determine the width of the box. So if this here is my... Um, this is my 40 stitch cast on. So I have 20 here. Then if I want to have um, whatever inches that is, let's say that is 10 inches, it clearly isn't. But you know how to multiply it to get to the 40 or divide it to get to the 40 that you know how much you need. The other thing that you may want to do is, I very often work with a scale. It's a very inexpensive scale. Um, I think I bought this at Canadian Tire at one point or another. Um, and I use it for uh, weighing my yarn or the finished product or whatever it is. Because I flossed at Yarn Chicken so many times, I can't even tell you. So if one of these little squares is 15 grams or 20 grams, and I need to know, I, I know I need to make a hundred for the size that I need. I know about how much yarn I need. Because I'm going from weight to weight. If you measure the length, that is a little bit more difficult in this instance. Um, so I would recommend the weight. Um, if you go with one one number, like they're all number four yarns, the weight is about the same. Is there, um, do you need to leave yourself a little bit of room for a tail at the beginning and a tail at the end? Yes, yeah, so I wouldn't, um, if that thing, if that little square weighs 10 grams and I have 15 grams of yarn or 12, I'll use it. If it doesn't, then that might not be it. Now, in the memory blankets or any of these squares, you can actually knit until the yarn runs out and then you just feed in a new one and it doesn't matter. Um, here, for example, I, I 
knitted the yellow and I ran out of the yellow so I just added the blue I did not wait to run out of the yellow I knitted until my back row was finished so that when I knit on the new color I wanted to have a clean transition now does that matter in these scrap blankets no probably not um, but I thought because I want to have the clean transitions in the front I might as well keep that theme going all the way through these are just thoughts at the end of the day it's your blanket it is your project it's your yarn and it'll be for you maybe you love to just knit and you give them for donation or whatever you can use every little tiny scrap of yarn now what if you want to have um If you want to knit two yarns together or you have a yarn that is a number four but remember i said it's a range so it could be from uh, 12 to 18 wraps you could be on either end of the spectrum so when you knit with it you think Ooh, this is kind of thicker why is this so thin there's always something else that you can do with it now i believe like if it's in that range it will block out for you like if it's if it's within other blocks or if it's a stripe that will block out because the yarn span is just like that and, and yarn is actually pretty forgiving but let's say you have a sock yarn or um, something I knitted um, this color in and I thought that was actually a bit on the lighter side even though it says DK I think it's more like a, a, a like a sport or something so I have a little bit of mohair left from lining mittens and I could totally twist these two together. It'll make a new fabric and I can knit that together. Or I could have knitted two strands together, even though that might have been a bit thick. I could have used a sock yarn or a lace yarn to put together with this. So don't be afraid to experiment. The reason why I personally don't like doubling up on sock yarns or any yarns when you do this because I find I'm always drawn to color and the sock yarns that are beautiful in color and that I really like they're really not cheap and not just are they not cheap but I love the color that's why I buy it so if I have leftovers and I put them together with some other color I lose what I love about that yarn so I tend to not like doing that the only thing that I could see myself doing is um, maybe have a neutral like a creamy or a beigey or a light gray or some other neutral color that I hold that as the main and then feed my sock yarn in it so that that sock yarn still shines in in its original um, composition that I was attracted to in the first place. Because when I look at a blanket, I'm tactile and I wanna see color and interest. I don't wanna see all of the colors run together in the mud. I'm pretty sure that they look pretty, especially when you can gradate them like fades or whatever, but I'm not really sure I would go for that for the first thing. Now, if that is your thing, there's no rules. Like I said, it's your blanket, it's your yarn. Who's going to tell you what to do with it? Like nobody. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that. Now, what colors really go together? Let's say you have the whole table is full with yarns either in partial balls or brand new balls or what have you like how do i even get started here um what you can use is a color wheel now quilters use this all the time painters use it um this is actually a joan wolfram and if you go on Creative Bug, and Creative Bug is really inexpensive. They, um, it's a website and it's like 
crafty used to be or whatnot and they have like hundreds of um of little teaching videos about all kinds of different things um painting knitting crocheting sewing quilting photography a little bit soap making cooking booking baking whatever you want they often have like two months free or you get the whole year for like i don't know 50 bucks or whatever not expensive but Joan Wolfram runs a, a class in there about colors and color specific for knitters. And I found that actually, even as a quilter, I found that very useful. Um, so I do like what she thinks about color. But when you look at the colors here, your color range, somebody had said to me years ago, and maybe I read it, um, there are 20, over 20,000 different greens and your eye can only see about 10 if you're really good with color you can see 20 but that's it out of all of that and i thought holy cow <laughs> that's pretty impressive and i think it's like this with every color scale so when you look at i don't know let's say it's look at this lime here or chartreuse if you look at from here you down in 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 between here there is so many color variations it's like never ending so if you look at contrast you would look at christmas colors i think are probably the best the best um iteration because the christmas colors are red up here oops sorry red up here which is a true red and the green is opposite. You can see that. If I were to draw my pencil line from one to the other, the red lens on the green. And they are 100% full contrast. I want to put the ruler on the side of it. Um, if you go for maximum contrast, now sometimes you really don't want to go for maximum contrast. You want to have more uh, a smoother color. So you can go in a Y. Um, I'll turn it this way so that you can see. This color to this color to this color. So it would be the greens with the purples and the reds or the pinkies that are in there. Or you can do the anogalous, like the ones that are beside one another. There's many ways to figure that out. And sometimes just look at color everywhere you go look at color and and if you start picturing a color wheel in your head um that'll kind of help you another thing that helps is i love this this piece of fabric here and i will make a knitter's bag out of this um that can be an inspiration you can take this to the yarn store and have a look now if you're only in an area that has a big box store um they might and they might not have lots of those colors you might have some of these colors in your stash um some of the yarn stores they kind of snark at acrylics which i think acrylics has a a place in life just like everything else or you may want to use a blend or who wants to hand wash like a king size bed blanket um but do you see who has the range of colors that you like now let's say you like something like this and this is a piece of fabric and it has like these muted browns and whatnot when you see fabrics they have the fabric dots on the end now here it's cut off but it, it helps illustrate the point of these are all the colors that are in there and usually they're in in the numbers that they're represented so number one to number 20 or whatever is in there number one would be the most and number 20 would be the least um this is a piece of tula pink um the little bugs so you can tell i'm a quilter and here are the colors that are in there so you can learn about colors and all kinds of things but there are tons of tools out there that'll actually get you going where you want to go and be successful right the first time. And let's face it, if you spend a half a year knitting on a blanket, 
you won't get that time back was that your free time and you enjoyed that time and all of that yes i i hear you i get it and the time goes by anyways but it's something that you're proud of when you're done um one more sample about that is this is another tula pink um and here you can see all of these colors are in there so you can pick your blanket colors according to whatever you like or take the painting behind me that has all of that gray scale in there like you can make these monochromatic blankets that are all grays and nothing else but gray gray and cream and maybe a few pops of color in there and maybe not so when i was thinking about that i was thinking Let's pick the color blue and go from blue to greenish. So if you pick everything that is blue and everything that is green and you put it in there, that would make a monochromatic blanket for anybody, a gentleman or boys, like my boys are not color white. Well, my little guy is, little guy, he's 26, he's not little. but my older son he would like to have the muted colors for sure but you can make that in any color um and then if if you think oh there's 50 million blues but i don't just want to make it blue add some greens in there or what happens if you add a little bit of gold in there it changes the dynamic of the colors or burgundy or or um, a fuchsia or a purple. Don't be afraid to experiment with color. And if you're afraid of the color and you're not sure if they work together, then just work a little square. So one of the things why I like the mitered squares is, number one, they, they get rid of um, all of these little bits and bobs that we love that are scraps, but not really scraps because they're just a part of a color palette that you love, um, but that are just accumulating and you really don't know how to put them together. So this is a great way of doing it. And you can make little squares or you can make big squares. And if you just want to see, do those two colors work together and you never you never use that square again, but you have enough for practice piece, you can make a regular square. It doesn't need to be a mitered square or whatever. And then just finish it off and use it as a coaster. If you're going on your blanket and you have made four of these or six or eight of them they can be a pillow or a table runner or a placemat to go with it or whatever you want they don't need to be these huge statement pieces when you're finished there's things that you can do with the little ones um very often when i um start to teach beginners and we teach the class we do these miter squares and then i have them doing from the tip up or i have them doing from the uh, cast on to the tip and then you just finish them as little bits like coasters and you can put four or six together and you can put them in tissue paper and put them in a pretty box and give them as gifts and they're very portable and they would get rid of scraps and if you think that you just love to knit or whatever or you know somebody that has this fantastic um that that you know and you love and they have maybe whatever their their living room is red and black or whatever colors like you can color coordinate that you can color coordinate these little coasters or pillowcases or whatever and use them as gifts and your hands are busy all the time so that's the thing about the color theory and okay one more thing that I want to say about that is let's say you don't have any scraps and you just want to go to the store and pick 15 balls and just start 
So think about your colors, how you like them. Use some inspiration in your life of things that you that you love, like colors that make you feel good. Um, and then buy according to that. Or if you have lots of oranges and you think, oh, I want to have like olives and, 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 and blues and everything else that goes with that, just buy what you need to restock that color palette for that project. So what about mixing materials? Can you mix materials? Well, the blanket is yours. You do you, you do what you want. Mm. What you have to be careful of is whatever the fussiest to wash is, that is what you will have to wash your blanket or your item as. So if I have some mulberry silk and I use some superwash wool and then I use some acrylic, I will have to wash it by hand because the mulberry silk will kink together and felt so fast and so much that your eyes haven't even finished that blink and you get a mess. Is that um, impossible to fix? No, <laughs> but it's frustrating and it might be a little bit more work or, or um, than, than you thought it might be and it'll wreck whatever your work is. So can you mix fibers? Yes, you can. However, whatever the most delicate fiber or the fussiest fiber in that mix is, this is how you're going to have to wash it. So keep that in mind. If you have um, a huge blanket, it'll have to go in the bathtub and you're going to have to have the, the husband and the boyfriend and the kids and the dog and the cat. Everybody will have to help you wring it out and lay it out. That is how it needs to be. Now, in the old days, and I'm pretty sure I might get some flack for that, but the wool sweaters and all of that, and my mother still does that, and I actually do some of that, they don't need to be washed every single time you, you wear it. What you should do with them is air them. Like, um, my mom on a rainy day or when it's snowy out there, she'll go and she'll get her sweater and she'll just, um, she'll just, Stick it in the snow and let that clean it. And they used to do that for hundreds of years and nobody took offense at that or nobody said, oh, you stink. This is not clean. This is not bacteria free or, or whatever it is. It worked for a lot of years and nothing wrong with that. So that is another thought. So if you um, if you use that blanket all the time and you think, well, it, it kind of could use a good airing or a good wash on, on a nice day or even not a so nice day, lay it over your balustrade at the, on the porch or wherever and let it get completely aired out and then shake it out and bring it back in and you have almost like a new garment. There are um, the fuzzers or the pillars or whatever that you can um, that you can use on them if they start pilling and unfortunately um, yarn does that some does it more than others some acrylic does it more than others um, but usually it just pills to a certain point and then it's done. With the wool, with the acrylic, I'm not really sure if that pills on forever or not. Um, I don't know. One of the things that I did notice is um, for this blanket here that I'm using as my Tetris memory blanket that I'm writing the pattern for, I'm, I'm using some of these Red Hard yarn cakes that are acrylic and I'm using some yarns from my stash, but I'm also addicted to, or I was, 
addicted to these shawls that are either crochet shawls or whatever and you just drape them around you and these cakes here are just the perfect thing for it. The colors are already together, which is pretty cool. And yeah, they are number fours. It says that they are, yeah, use a five millimeter uh, needle or a five millimeter hook. You get 18 stitches per uh, 10 centimeters or four inches or 13 single crochets per 10 centimeters. Now, that is a range, but I find that I'm pretty good with getting gauge. And if you're a couple of stitches off for blanket, that's actually not a big deal. Um, if you ever do want to look at that, I think it's easy. It's it's neat to track how close can you get to the gauge that they recommend. Because if you find that you're often pretty close, then sometimes that's good enough because I think knitting is all about the joy of it. If you would want to do all of this math and figure everything out, you'd be a designer. You wouldn't be the, the knitter. And I don't want to say just the knitter, but I always think like if I want to learn how to fix the bathrooms, I'd be a plumber. I'm not interested in that. So therefore I'll get somebody to do that. But um, it's the same with knitting. Like you don't want to have to figure everything out. For me, even when I design and because of my rheumatoid arthritis and, and mental illness and anxieties and everything that goes on, I do suffer from brain fog and it creeps up on me on the darndest times. And I think I can almost see the word, almost, but just not enough to grab it. And the more I want to concentrate on it, the less I can get the word. So for me, things have to be simple and easy stuff that I can remember. I don't want to, well, I do sometimes. It depends what I'm working on. So do I like intricate things? Do I like learning new things? Yes, all the time. And I'm up for that. Do I like fussy things? Mm -mm. Maybe when I was younger, but now I just don't care. <laughs> like I just, so when I develop a pattern or when I think of a pattern or I knit a pattern and it's really complicated where I have to read the sentences three times before I even know what they're talking about. I'm just like, Ugh. so when I design, I look at, at something and then I think, okay, so now make it simple. Like if I don't knit for a few days or if I'm not having really a great mental health day and I still want to knit, I want to be able to knit and not have to come back and frog all of this stuff tomorrow because I don't need practice frogging. Like, I don't think anybody does. So <clears throat> even in the patterns or when I make a YouTube, I'll look for hours and hours and hours. There is no point in repeating somebody else that does it really well. But when I can't find what I'm looking for, I usually go and make it myself and then I look at it and I think so now make it simple like dumb it down completely like and then if I want to if I have a day for example um my air and winter socks there are boot socks and like I said before I have rheumatoid arthritis and Raynaud's so my feet are always cold and I have maybe 30 hand knit socks in fingering yarn well they are actually not warm enough for my feet right now. Like I need thicker socks. So I was looking at all kinds of different patterns. And the thing is, when you look in my la uh, Ravelry library, I think I have 3000 patterns or whatever. Most of them I bought, but I think that is more a compulsion of you see something and you like it and it's only a few dollars and you buy it and thank God I don't have to store them in my house. I just store them on my Ravelry library because if I would see them every day, I think I would make myself sick. Um, but I think 
this is completely my thought here, a well-written pattern for me and the way that my brain works is give me a template, not a complicated template, just give me a template, like give me a well-written sock. And then if I want to put in, if I want to knit it top down, I want to knit it top down and it doesn't matter. Um, if I'm not having a good day, I can still knit that sock and not mess it up. And the next week I have a fantastic week and just a vanilla sock, which is just a basic recipe kind of thing, is not enough. I can add color work or I can put in, I don't know, knit three pearl one or broken rib or any other pattern that I want, but the pattern is so well written that you can easily put that in there. And you gave me some examples of that and I will love you forever and I will be your client forever. And that is the pattern that I want. I don't need to memorize 50,000 different things. I just need to memorize a couple of different steps and that is it. And those steps are almost so easy that I can't even bugger it up, even if I have a bad day. And I mean, I do have bad days where I think like, uh, I can't remember what I was talking about and I lose myself in my own sentence and you know, it happens. So that is real. So when I was, even when I was doing the memory blanket, um, because I had designed the soft blanket and I was thinking, mm, well, now people are going to have lots of, lots of little leftovers that they can't use for the cuff, heel or toe and, or they don't want to or whatever. So memory blankets, you love memory blankets. So come up with something. So I, I haven't made one for years and I was thinking, oh, geez, now I have to look it up. And then you look it up online and there is like 50 different ways of doing it. And for all you need to look, where is the front, where is the back and where is this and where is that? I don't want all of that. So I thought, okay, so actually I know the concept and I'm just going to go and write it. And you don't care what your front or what your back is. You just do the same thing in every single row until your square is done. And then that is what I like. And if you really, really, really get bored, you can throw a few eyelets in. So this fits right in here. Um, we think, okay, so we're going to use a number four and I'm going to use a number four for everything. And I'm going to use a, a four millimeter or five millimeter knitting needle. Yep, I got it. And I'll remember that. Well, wouldn't you know, I must have checked it five times and I didn't remember. So here I used a four and a half. And I thought I better write that down because just in case. And I didn't. And then I wrote it down a few hours later and I, and I wrote down a number four millimeter. So I wrote down how many stitches and I wrote down my, um, my needle. And I use these little, um, stitch markers that I actually don't use for stitch markers. I just use them for place markers and you get these little tags like at Christmas time, wherever you get like a hundred of them for a dollar. Or if I need a bigger one, um, I have the, oh, this doesn't even have a hole in it now that I look at it, um, but I can punch a hole in it and I can write all of my information in here and stick it on because I think I remember and then I don't. So what happened is I thought I used a needle number four in this and then I used a number four in this and I knit it on and I'm just watching TV. I'm actually not really paying attention. So I'm knitting this and I knitted the yellow one and then I knitted the green one and I thought, oh, you know, so maybe I should just try to put some eyelet in and I'm going to, I'm going to see if I make an irregular eyelet, just one here, one there, here I make three, there I make four and whatever, because it's my blanket and sometimes I don't like everything symmetrical. As a matter of fact, I never do. And I knitted this and I thought, okay, so that's pretty good because I can use that as one of my samples. And then the next day when I came down, I thought, 
that's what would happen here, obviously. This is not the same size. You don't even have to have glasses on to see that. And if it just puckers a little bit or pulls it in, that's just a tension thing. This is not a problem. But obviously, this row here that I knitted, I think I knitted with needle number four, where this was a four and a half or a five. And yeah. Now, would this even out in a big blanket? Sure, it would. And would it stay that way? Like if I surround it by bigger ones? Yes. But to be honest with you, I'm not going to bother with that. I'm not opposed to fogging. Um, I always think like these things, like we talked about earlier, or I said earlier, they hang around for a very, very long time. And if every time I look at it and I see a buckle in here in the, just these two squares and I think one of those squares probably takes about a half an hour or whatever it is I should have fixed it if I think that every single time I look at this this blanket for example I took the joy out of it I made it and I think I should have fixed it well right now I'm still right here and I can fix it and I can rip it back and re-knit it and it'll be fine and then it'll be off my brain I'll if in a year from now I remember that I had that I knitted those two squares with a different needle and I had to rip it back if I remember that, I would actually be surprised because chances are I, I won't remember that. But if I don't fix it and I see it for the next five years, I will, will remember that every time I see that blanket and I think, yeah, I wish I would have fixed that because I was right there. It would have taken like no time at all and I could have fixed it. Then I fix it, and that's my thing about fixing. That's my opinion. It doesn't need to be yours, and you hear many times, oh, it's just another design element. Sure, if that's what you wanna think, then I think go ahead and do that. But for myself, no, I'll fix it. Um, if it would not make a difference, if it would have been just like, oh, I think, um, Maybe those two colors, I could have done a better choice or whatever. I wouldn't fix that because at the end of the day, when all of the colors are together, if you look at nature, like all of the colors are thrown together. You have a blue sky, you have green water or blue water, you have white snow, you have dirty snow, you have leaves, you, you, you have everything. There is a plethora of colors in, in the world that just work together. So if you overthink it, it's not going to help you and it's going to it's going to work together. I think the only thing that I stick to on those two things is I don't like um, mud colors and clear colors together because then at the end, they'll dull your other colors down. Now, if that's what you want to do, then that's fine. But if, if that is not what you had in mind, then keep that in mind. But otherwise, like I don't, um, I don't stress about my knitting too much. I think knitting is fun. And I want to be proud of my knitting. I want the people that I gift it to or give it to, to be proud of my knitting and to actually honor the time that I spent on it. So, um, for example, my younger son, he is 26. I think he was 20 at the time. And he had seen, and that was probably the first time that I did the mitered corners. I've not done that before. He saw this this blanket and it's called U shift on I don't know wherever he puts us around on on the net like Reddit Twitch I have no idea what website he goes to but he said oh my god mom one of the gamers came up with this um with this blanket and it's uh, uh this is the blanket and in she made it or her mom made it or I don't even know now who made it um. And he showed it to me and I thought, oh my God, I just fell in love with that. Within half an hour, I had the blanket. No, I found the pattern. 
and found the website, found the pattern, bought the pattern. Didn't um, in this store the way that they made it, it was made with a thinner weight yarn, like a sporty weight yarn. And I knew I wanted to make it in a bigger yarn so that it can go on his bed. And it just had an I cord edge, and that's also not what I wanted. I wanted to have a true border around it. And I knitted it within two weeks. I couldn't even put it down. And it was so big that it fit on his double bed and hangs off. And for years, that blanket was on his bed every single day. And before, that kid never made his bed in his life. But he made his bed every day when that blanket was on it. And it is called the U-Shift Afghan. And this is it. And now I want to see, can you see the, no, not on this one. So I'll show you a different picture of it. Here you can see, sorry, here you can see the border of the bottom. Like I just wanted to get the corner more or less. Um, it is just a massive, beautiful blanket. And that actually brings me to some others that you can um, make. When you put in um mitered squares or um bento blankets now some of these for example they're crocheted but because you you start off with a rose and then it ends up in this little square you can do this no problem and you would your first rose would be white and then you use the brown then white again and then red and when you add the next one you start again with white so there is no grid in between it looks like a fake grid and that's what i like about these these little squares here like every time you make them they come out a little bit different and you think like oh my gosh like i just can't i just can't look at it i they're just beautiful and they they can look complex they can look easy and on this one here you can really see like you start off with the one color and then you add that blip of color in the top there and if this would be all in the same color it would look like um fake sashing and and this here is a blue with gold tones and whatever and this here is a much brighter version so don't be afraid to to um they look like broken tiles or whatever. I think they are just so stunning and beautiful. And I threw in some quilts as well because they do have a lot more examples in quilts than they do in the mitered squares. And I think that's because people are really unsure with how to play with color. But in reality, this is not that big of a deal. This is... um. This is a yarn chart. When you put in yarn weights on the Google, it comes down like this. And one of the better charts actually tells you um, how many wraps it is per inch, but that sometimes doesn't tell you anything. If you wanna compare like, are all of my number four weights the same or all number two or whatever. But what it will also tell you that it goes anywhere from 23 to 26 stitches or in the lace weight it goes from 33 to 40 stitches so you can see like there's a seven stitch difference now that's lace obviously um if you have a super bulky you get seven to 11 stitches now four stitches difference in a bulky that's like this much difference and it it really brings to it teaches you how how gauge how does gauge even work like why do we care about it on a blanket you don't care about it but as you knit it and you get some yarns that are just a tad thinner even though they're the same weight how it makes it smaller or bigger and in a little square like this it it may or may not matter but if you have a garment that you want to have slim fitted or whatever and you multiply a bit like this and let's say you're four stitches bigger than you should be or one stitch bigger and you multiply that by your circumference you might be 20 stitches off and 20 stitches can be like this much so it'll either fit or not you may either like how it fits or 
not i mean um when you knit things like this it it really kind of shows you even the different yarn weights and let's face it we're we're not all experts in in this stuff so you get to start learning somewhere and if you have a um a scrap blanket which I really don't like the word scrap because I think that's destined to throw away like you throw scraps in the garbage. Um, I think more like a patchwork uh, blanket or a patch a scrappy patchwork or whatever you want to call it doesn't really matter. Um, it'll really show you if you pay attention to it. All kinds of different things it'll show you like there is yarns that almost feel the same as others and I hate working with it they hurt my hand they don't glide from the needle they're super splitty I mean if you have a splitty yarn sometimes it helps if you have a rounder tip for your knitting needle but um, some yarns it doesn't matter what I do to it and I don't like it so I I realized that and I'm gonna put them in a box and they're just gonna be gifted to I don't know somebody that knits for charity or put it on our Facebook giving tree and whatever and somebody will be happy I'll make somebody's day I'm quite sure but it's they've been in my stash for a long time and I just don't like how they knit or they hurt my hand or um I don't know and really even if I have 20 balls of that yarn, I'm not going to search my brain for days. Why do I not like knitting with it? And what's the, no, don't worry about it. Um, it can go and then it'll be off my brain and I don't feel guilty about it. Somebody else is going to use it and that's fine. One more thing that I wanted to touch about on these um, patchwork blankets or blankets of different colors is when you can you mix in different structured yarns and the answer is yes so we have a yarn store here and it's in in london ontario and it's called the london yarns and um it's run by a lovely bunch of ladies well um one lady and but she has lovely stuff and whatnot and they have um she is very good like in her store she has like um a couple of blankets that are just structurally different and they're um either all that really really pale pale pink which i'm not a pink person but oh my god i love that blanket and um she has one in cream and i think they are just so beautiful and what they are is you know that eyelash yarn that nobody knows how to use really well there's a couple of rows knitted with that and then she has a couple of rows knitted with some other funky yarn and then a couple of regular yarn rows and then a couple of like fuzzy things in there and it is so the color is almost various shades of the color it's very monochromatic and it looks very cohesive and the rows are knit back and forth they're not boxes like um like the mitered squares or any other squares and I think it would work in it or crochet whichever you want um, but she has the different textures in it and it's just almost a luxurious item that you would think you buy at a high-end yard at a high-end store for like a thousand dollars or whatever now some of the yarns I think are, are luxurious that she has in there but don't be afraid to mix and match. One other thing that you may want to consider. So as these blankets get bigger and bigger, they get heavier. Some of these blankets are like, they can weigh up to like seven pounds or five pounds and you lift them and you think, ooh, all right. They can be substituted for weighted blankets. Um, now, if you have a, a very delicate elderly person, you don't want to have a blanket that's already so heavy that it hurts their bones just putting it on. So again, keep in mind, who is this for? But let's say you suffer from anxiety and you would really love to have a weighted blanket and, and they're quite expensive. Um, 
you can twist yarns together and you can knit them with a super bulky 10 or whatever because all you want is the weight of it and and you can purchase the yarns at thrift stores there is tons of them um you can get the yarns in many different places and you can twist them together to make all different colors or you can try to be in all in one color family or whatever it is and you can crochet that or knit that and because they're so bulky they knit up faster than than a normal blanket like with a seven or eight needle millimeter um and you do get weight out there and what happens is when you put these these weighted blankets on um they shouldn't be more than 10% of your body weight and you do have to watch if you have like little critters that like to get under the blankets with you because it's also to their body weight. Um, they slow down your heartbeat and when that happens, your brain makes more melatonin and serotonin so it's almost like you're giving yourself a hug and it calms whatever anxiety or whatever stresses that you have off the day plus needlework in itself is already keeping your brain uh, uh, in a low stress threshold so um, that is another thing to think about so um, just to re reiterate um, look in your stash or buy all of the same weights somewhere can you mix fibers yes but the most delicate fiber, that's how you will need to wash it. Um, can you mix textures? Of course you can. Can you mix all colors together? Yes. Can you just make it monochromatic in whatever color? Yes. Do they need to be boring? Absolutely not. Um, does it matter what size I make? Do they need to go on forever or can it be small? Yes, 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 whatever. You do you. And that is what I always want to inspire to is like, don't be afraid. It's a ball of yarn and it's two knitting needles or crochet hook. You already bought it. It belongs to you. It, nobody else needs to like it except for you. So often do I hear, oh, I don't like that quilt or I don't like that particular item or whatever and I keep thinking in my brain I'm thinking well good because it's not made for you it's made for whoever made it or for, for whoever my son had asked me for um a Garfield sweater when he was a kid and I thought okay so I'll make you a Garfield sweater and it was this bright orange acrylic and then it had the fuzzy 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 black acrylic running through it and it was a stripe and then the fuzzy and then a stripe and a fuzzy and then as i kept knitting it i kept saying to him like are you sure this is what he want what you want and he kept saying yes and then when it was finished and he put it on i'm pretty sure he swallowed a couple of times thinking holy moly what did i say to mom to make and she actually has the ability to make it I don't know what happened to that sweater, but I do remember <laughs> that I did make him wear it to school because he made me work. He made me make that sweater and it took me like, I don't know, three days or whatever it took. Um, what has he learned? He'll not ask me for things that he doesn't like. What have I learned? I know I'm a lot better than he knows himself, so the next time we ask for something outrageous, that's just a fad. No. But in general, you need to like it, and that's all there is to it. Like, how often do, do little kids ask for all kinds of weird things, and you think, oh my gosh, these colors, they don't go together and whatever. But when they wear it, they feel like they're the most beautiful, or they feel whatever they feel like. Who cares what anybody else thinks like you do you and you do your family and you do whatever works in this world of cancel society and everybody's opinion counts well in reality your opinion counts as well and I hope I enabled you to knit something that you've not tried before or try color combinations that you've not tried before or gave you some some mental push or thoughts 
to inspire you to do something. If I have, or if you ever have any questions about anything, just leave me a comment, hit the like button, hit the subscribe. I find that there, um, it's quite encouraging to make videos that people watch, but it's even more encouraging if you get a like or a comment to say, well, you did this well, or can you explain that next time a little bit more? Or I did X and I find, I don't know, I don't really know how to do that. Then let me know and I'll pop back in. And if I can, I'll help you out. So that's enough for today. We've been just a little bit over an hour, a little bit longer than I thought we were going to be, but happy knitting. And I will talk to you next time when we work on a Tetra square. Thank you.